Okay, or, guys. Or... Awesome. So we are going to give it just a minute to let some people hop <laughs> on. I am so encouraged that we already have so many um, faces popping on. And as Anna was just saying, this means that this is a topic that people are super interested in because we never have anybody hopping on early. Um, and so this is really great and it's encouraging. Um, as Anna was just saying, there is a link in the chat box. Our hope with this is that we are going to be taking notes. We are going to be listening to concerns. We want this to be high engagement. This by no means is Anna and I coming and, and telling anybody anything, right? It's about collaborating and community and understanding how we can get comfortable um, with this as a as a whole. Um, the link in the flow desk is for a mastermind that we are going to do where we intend on dropping content. We want to make Canva links that are editable for people to be able to have conversations on what can we implement now? What should we talk we be talking about uh, with our buyers and sellers now? Because as Anna mentioned, there's a lot of clickbait out there. There's a lot of information that our consumers are are looking at and they believe that they're they're educated about this um and and frankly i don't know about you but we're not educated about it yet right we're still learning um so we want to make sure that this is a topic that we collaborate on uh together as a group and then we bring content that makes us feel comfortable moving forward with our with our buyers and sellers okay? i think another big thing for today too is we don't have the bandwidth or probably enough context to sit here and talk for 30 to 40 minutes about this topic. So another thing we, we were trying to just encourage is like pipe in, like if you have something that you feel like you really understand or something that you've dug deeper on that you can share. I mean, today really shouldn't be like a sit and passive listen today really should be our community coming together and sharing thoughts. So whether I'm going to monitor the chat very closely, um, but like, please feel free just to like, hop on, interrupt someone, like it's, it's really hard on zoom. Cause you, you, there's that lack, um, but just hop on, let us know, you know what questions you have things that we need to, to look at that maybe someone has a different perspective on. Um, I think that will be the best use of our time this morning is really just, just get in here and have conversations. Don't, don't feel like you've got to, to receive information, um, share and, and start conversation. All right. Well, let's dive in. Okay, so um, there, I also shared a link in the chat that is a YouTube live that was recorded through EXP. I found a lot of great um, information that was very valuable and helped me understand this at a higher level. Um, so please feel free to watch that. Please feel free to share. Um, I think the biggest thing is that I, I want to start this conversation off with, I believe that chaos breeds opportunity right? So the reason that we wanted to come here is because there's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of people that are really stressed out about this. And so I believe that this is actually a good thing for our industry. And the reason that I feel this way is because it's going to allow the agents that um, have the ability and the knowledge to um, communicate with their clients to go back to the days of sitting down and having buyer consultations and helping buyers understand at a higher level what our value is, right? Um, that is something that's going to help us move forward as an industry. And so it's going to take a little bit of talent to, to talk to our buyers and explain to our buyers what that looks like. And on the other side, which we're going to share some graphics on, is what does this conversation look with our look like with our sellers? So has anybody already had questions coming from buyers and sellers since Friday? Has anybody had the phone ring and, and people asking, like, what's going on? What does that conversation look like? Brett Davis said, yep. What do you do here, Brett? I know you work with lots of buyers and sellers in our market. Um, yeah, so they're just trying to get our take on it. I made a post the other day about, you know, if somebody had questions not to like buy into the fake news, I would rather them reach out to me and have a discussion about it. But I think they're really panicked because they think they're not going to get representation on the buyer side and they want it. And so that's a really good sign for me. Um, I'm, I'm not too concerned now. It's just figuring out how to articulate that because they're so afraid they're going to either have to pay for that and they can't afford it or that it's going to completely go away and they're going to go up against the seller and not know how to negotiate. I think the big thing here too, um, as we, as we talk to our buyers and sellers is to make the comment that, you know, commissions have always been negotiable. 
right? And there's there's never been a conversation that this was not a negotiation. Um, and the second thing is that this is a judgment that is not going to be finalized until July. So if you're actively working with buyers and or they're under contract, I think that putting their mind at ease that nothing has actually changed yet, right? Um, and so I've had the same situation where sellers have called and said, well, what does this mean? Does this mean that we do not have to pay a buyer's agent? Um, and so that's a conversation that we have to get very comfortable with. And for me, as a very strong, heavy listing agent, um, I find a lot of value in our buyer's agents because our buyers do want to be represented. It's like you just said, Brett, like their fear is that they're not going to be represented. Um, and so I think the question around that is, is, you know, what does that conversation look it like? Looks like from the agent's Anna, you want to pipe in? Yeah, sorry, I was trying to make sure I muted. Um, yeah, one of the, you know, the feel felt found script, right? We all use that. Um, I always, in every presentation, I'm always looking to go back and try to find examples of where something's existed in the marketplace already. Um, and I think a lot of us we went through COVID, right? And I think we have to remember too that a lot of these lawsuits are coming out of COVID era sales where like, to be fair, like maybe commissions were a bit inflated based on what was happening in the marketplace from a marketing standpoint. And, and so one of the things that we we came back and we looked at was, hey, look, you know, during COVID, a lot of builders, at least in our market, they killed all of our commissions, right? I mean, Lennar was paying us nothing, right? And I think what we forget is that there is something that's much bigger than um, all of the things. And it's it's the invisible hand that is our economy. And so I, I've kind of gone back and said, hey, look, there was a period where buyer commissions weren't offered. And we we saw that change as the market shifted. We see now builders offering all kinds of money, throwing all kinds of bonuses at us in, two, in 23 when those interest rates went high. So I think that I just put a little text message that we sent out to our database um, that just kind of reiterates that, you know, during COVID, some builders paused commissions, but market demand brought them back. The market's invisible hand guides us. No single ruling fits every single home sale. Stay tuned for updates. And I think that is an important thing to get back to is that like, th this is not a one size fits all. Um, just like we've never had fixed commissions. And as real estate agents, we know that if you go through my books, books. you could never see a pattern of what our commission was. There was no set commission. It was completely dependent on circumstance, properties, all of those things. And so I think it is really important to to go back and say, we've already lived through some of these shifts in just the last couple of years. Um, and just reminding people that, you know, the market is going to dictate a lot of this. And, and as much as we like to have complete control over that, um, th there are factors out there that are, that are beyond just us. So I actually want to jump in really quickly. So I keep thinking about this. Um, I don't know. I just remember specific scenarios, whether it was during COVID or prior, I'm not sure it probably just low inventory in general. But we already have practice with this if you guys are solution focused agents, right? Like during the low inventory during COVID, we were looking for other solutions to find properties for our buyers off market. So for sale by owners is something I keep thinking about. Anytime we are to find a for sale by owner, we're negotiating our commission. Like you guys already have practice doing this. You approach a for sale by owner and you say, are you offering commission? They say yes or no. And if they're not offering commission, then, you know, we turn that around and we tell our buyer, well, you have the choice to either pursue this property and I'll try to negotiate the commission and try to get them to, them to pay us, or you can decide to go look at another property. And most of the time they'll say, I'll go look at another property. But when they do say, I, I want to pursue this, I'm taking that to a for sale by owner. And I'm saying, look, we have an offer for you but my buyer can't afford the commission. Will you offer me two and a half or 3%? And the first sale by owner does it every single time because they want to sell their home. So I just keep thinking about that situation and you kind of have to apply it here because it's the same thing. So if you have that skill of approaching that for sale by owner, it's essentially the same negotiation. Right. You're, you're exactly right. That it, it is just the ability to negotiate on your own behalf. And frankly, I think what worries a lot of agents is that does take a skill, right? Because that is a scary conversation. You want to feel like you're representing, especially for all the high E's and the E's in the room, right? We want to feel like we're putting our client first, that we're doing everything for our client. And sometimes our commission comes second to that because we want them to get to the finish line. However, you know, in this industry, if we can't negotiate for ourselves, we surely can't negotiate for our client. Um, but, but you're exactly right. Doing this with, um, 
out of out of market agents like in our market there's a lot of um, listings that are not in our mls but they're from charleston agents or agents in different markets we have to negotiate our commission and put compensation in there because we're not in their mls and we don't have access to that so this really isn't new it's just new from the way that we're practicing it through the MLS. Um, and it's about just having those conversations. I think some tactical things and what, what stresses agents out is that our, in South Carolina, our agency document changed. Um, I don't know who, who on here can tell me, I guess maybe six, eight months ago, Eric, I don't know if you remember when the agency document changed, but it, um, it changed and the verbiage on it says that the buyer is responsible for paying a, an X amount of percent. And a lot of agents said, no, 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 we're just going to put zero. You're not responsible for paying me. But that's not what the document says. If you read it and you're practicing it correctly, the document talks about how you will be compensated as an agent. And so if you've been practicing that correctly the last six to eight months, there really shouldn't be this big fear factor because you're negotiating ahead of time with your buyer on what your compensation will be. The difference now is that when I have a co-broke like Tim or Lauren or Eric on the other side, I have to pick up that phone and ask what what is the compensation or what is the buyer concession? Um, Anna and I were talking and she's got clients that if they're um, going to buy on a new build, the commission is X. If they're buying on a resale, the commission is X. And so they've got variable compensation as it is through, through North Carolina and what they see on a daily basis with their buyers. And so our thought was if it's an up to... And the rule is that you can go down on what has been previously negotiated, but you cannot go up. Then, you know, why don't we sit down with our buyers and say, look, this is what this looks like. This is the new industry standard. We have to agree ahead of time before I ever open a door for you, by the way, right? Before we ever get into agency, before I ever show you a house and represent you, we have to sit down and, and talk about what I'm going to do for you as a buyer's agent. This is my value proposition. And I will be get earning up to a certain amount. So if I put 3% on that document and they end up going on a piece of land that is offering 5%, I can't change my, my agency document and increase it to 5%. We previously negotiated an employment agency agreement for 3%. So there is no going down. So the concept is, is how do we get really good? And this is where we want content so that we can create these buyer documents and these seller documents for the conversation starters to say, look, we've seen commissions go all the way up to X percent. So this is my agreement to you that as we look at properties, um, I, I expect to get paid up to a certain amount. And so our, our thought process was, why isn't that number higher? Why don't we say 4% or 5%? Because you can always bring the commission down, but you can't bring the commission up. So I'm interested in everyone's thoughts around that. Is anyone on the call already? I'm just curious. Anyone on the call already at a very high level making up a gap. So, I mean, we talk about there's no set commission, right? In the triangle, buyer's agents get paid 2.4%. It's a number that's just been around for a long time. And so there have been, I know there are agents that do a great job saying, no, Mr. Buyer, like my commission is 3%. Um, and I know a lot of times they are truly like picking up that 0.6% from their buyers in closing costs, even in this environment. So is there anyone on this call that's already doing that at a high level that can kind of talk about how they've already been working on bridging the gap? I haven't been doing it, but there's multiple agents on my team that have been doing it or taking 7% listings. So they're just presenting it. This is what we offer. This is my fee is my professional fee is 3%. I'm going to go see compensation from the seller. If there is a gap, if it's, you know, 2.5 for new construction or 2.4, Mr. Buyer, you'd have to make up that difference at closing. And then they haven't come across any issues with it. We were actually going to do a training on it next week for the people that are already doing it. So, I mean, I think it's, we've always had that, at least in North Carolina, we've had that verbiage. We just, you know, if Lennar gave us 2000 or someone gave us, you know, a flat fee at a new construction, we weren't charging the buyer the other piece of it. We were just kind of letting that go. Well, it's a little different now because we're, you know, because we don't know if it's coming on the south side. And, you know, I was talking to Emily last night, Emily Brown in our market. She's our number one agent on the team. She's got 17 pending, 10 listings coming. She does a lot of listings. She's like, I don't think my conversation is going to change. Like, I'm still going to be going in at 6% or whatever her percent is that she decides. 
because we want to compensate the other buyer agent bringing the buyers. We want good pre-qualified buyers. And if we have people that we're not offering that to, and they're just a fly by night, Hey, I'm just going to show up and charge 0.5 or 1%. Well, then that's great for the seller in the end, but why don't we go ahead and offer it up front and then, you know, just we'll let the negotiations happen. So I think on the list side, it feels more comfortable. I think where we get into a problem is the buy side feeling like, Oh gosh, we have to charge them and what's going to happen next. Well then let's flip, let's flip this on its head. Okay. Mm -hmm. Who, who has a, a menu of services for listing agreements? When you walk into a listing, who on here has variable compensations, like a menu, for instance, to say, I do X services for 8%. If you want to do 7%, this is what I offer. And if you want to do 6%, this is what I offer. Do any agents on this call do this for listings when you go into a listing appointment? Brett Davis has her hand raised. Is it you, oh. Brett? Yeah. yeah, I've been doing this since COVID. Can you, I mean, I, Tim, were you going to say something? I was just going to say we used to. Um, so we used to have three packages somebody could choose from. Um, and, you know, for whatever reason, we stopped doing it. You know, the headwinds from COVID just kind of, you know, but I, I think we're going to get back to that. And I think we're also going to get back to, I mean, we've always been good about having buyer consultations about it, about telling our buyers what our fee is. Um, although it's been rare that we've actually had the buyer shore up the difference, but it's happened. Um, but I think a menu of services on the buyer side and treating your buyer just like you're having a consultation with a seller is the same thing. And I think, you know, to your point, chaos breeds opportunity. Right now, you know, you and I have both been in meetings, Allison, where agents were like, when the new buyer agency came out, said, I'm just not doing buyer agency anymore. Right. And buyers like truly need our, our guidance and will pay for it. And so, you know, they're just, they, they struggle to articulate value. And one of the easiest ways to articulate value is by presenting a menu of services and saying, you choose, right? I, yeah, I agree with that. Brett, what, what, what has been your experience? Uh, I, I think people in general really like choices. And so when you make a menu like that, and then you put in the middle what you want them to choose, you show them the cheap option, you show them the super expensive option, and they always choose right down the middle. And they feel like they have a say in it. And they also know what to expect for your services. Like you might do a five and a half. I don't even go below five and a half. You might have a five and a half service that all you do is you put it in the MLS and you host an open house. Like you guys also get to be in control of what you do for those services or, or for those fees. Like, I think that offering the choice to both sides, it just creates a healthier relationship in general. And that way you're not getting into a situation where they're not getting something that they, that they expected, but you never had that conversation up front. Do you, so for those of you that do the menu, a type style, do you ever get somebody who is saying, well, so you're not going to go all out for me if I do the cheapest option? Like, how do you have that conversation if they come up and say, well, I'm not getting your full effort if I'm doing the cheapest option? I think this is where your confidence comes in and knowing what you bring to the table, because I'll come in there and say, look, we're, you know, we're a luxury concierge service. Like I go above and beyond for all of my clients, but these are just the services that I provide for X package. If you really want all of the marketing services and X, Y, and Z that we offer, do this package. Like, I think just coming in with confidence and being really passionate about what you bring to the table is super important. Sammy, I, um, I've, I've been like really in these conversations and listening to masterminds and somebody on one of the masterminds, when, when somebody said, well, you're not a doctor and you're not an attorney, right? Like agents, we're not doctors and attorneys. Um, the, the reason that came up was because somebody said, well, does every attorney charge the same thing? And the answer is no, right? The answer is that there's different um, retainer fees per attorney. There's different, and it's based on it's based on levels of service. It's based on experience. It's based on years in the market and what they've done and their track record. And so I think where Brett's coming from as well is like, that's where the confidence comes from. It's about being so confident in the service that you're providing 
And so you'll start to see where these shifts happen. And I don't know how long um, everybody's been in the market on this, but I've been in eight years now and I have seen so many things come and go in this short period of time. Discount broker was a big thing. We had we had a company that came into our market that said that they will list your house for $500 flat. And I remember this was about two years into the market. I was so stressed out. I said, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to compete against that agent? How am I ever going to do it? I never, one, I never lost a listing. I don't think I ever went up against the agent, right? Because it was just a discount service. And usually when those houses would come on the market, they'd end up listing with a full-time agent within three or four weeks because they never sold because the client wasn't getting the service they expected. Or when the rubber met the road and they had to start negotiating um, against a buyer's agent, they tend to lose, right? Because nobody was representing them. All this is doing is flipping that model on its head. So the fear factor, and maybe that's the elephant in the room, is what agents, what buyer's agents are going to are going to cut their commission? What buyer's agents are going to sit down with the buyer and say, oh, Allison Greco wants 3%. I'll do it for one. Well, on the third transaction that they lose out and it's a multiple offer situation and they're not being negotiated for their inspections, you know, nobody's negotiating for them on their behalf. And then they eventually have to cut agency with that agent and find an agent that is worth their, you know, weight. Um, that's when this model is going to shift. So I really encourage everybody to let go of the fear and don't make decisions on fear and really understand what your value proposition is, because it is no different than discount brokers from a listing standpoint. I don't know if anybody's been in the market long enough to see those come and go and kind of what you think about that concept, but I feel like it's, it's a parallel. Well, Tina talked about it on um, our fast forward call on Monday. I mean, the, the discount brokers are still in our marketplace and they did not even in COVID right when it was impossible to not sell a home, they, they still didn't, didn't run us out of business. I mean, open door did not take my business out during COVID. Um, you know, as of today, like our discount brokers in town, they exist, but they, my business is still thriving and gaining market share day by day. Um, I think one thing that like, is just like a 30,000 feet up and it's really been helpful and comforting for me to think about in all this is that I really believe, and I haven't been in the industry forever. Um, but I grew up around it. My dad was a developer. I lived through 08, 09. So like I, I have lived in real estate, what feels like my whole life. Um, I got licensed in 15 and so I had pre COVID years we became a very reactive industry in COVID. And I, I think this is one of the conversations I want to open up is how are we going to change some of our buyer processes as a result? Because we had this conversation, ironically, in our team meeting on Wednesday. I was like, we have, we called it wishy-washy Wednesday. We got buyers pulling out of contracts. We got, buy, we got agents telling us they're writing offers and then they disappear two days later. Like just very unsettling and unfocused, it feels like work. Um, and I think that some of it came from COVID era where we just were so reactive to what was going on around us. Um, and I think that one of the things that's going to come from this and my challenge on Wednesday before this even came out was let's get more, let's get more focused. Let's get more intentional with how we talk with our buyers, with our sellers, setting our appointments up, making sure that we have processes for people to file into. I think that this is going to force us to come back into being more process driven in us being in control of the process a little bit more and stop being that reactive Oh my gosh, my whole day has just flipped because a buyer has called, something's hit the market and we've got to go run over there and do it. No, like let's stop. Like we're allowing that chaos to exist um, because we're not putting people into processes. Um, and I think, you know, talking about comparing ourselves to other professionals in, you know, in, a, in America, I think it's important for us to realize they have processes. Like I can't just run up and be like, Hey, you know, like most sought after plastic surgeon on the planet. I want to, I want to facelift today. I'm going to show up at your office at 4 PM and you're going to perform it. Right. Um, that doesn't happen. Right. There there's, there's procedures there. So I think that that's something our team was focusing in on Wednesday. And I think it's one of my favorite things that came out of what we've been talking about over the last couple of days, because I feel like we are going to have to become process driven again. Um, and personally, I'm really excited for that. I'm excited because everything I just heard was you, you raised the level of professionalism, right? Like we're not getting in our car and running out and showing houses like we were because there was, there was no buyer consultation. There really was no professionalism. We were order takers. And so in, in South Carolina, I'm not sure about other States, but you know, at first contact, you were supposed to show and have explanation of agency signed. 
I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands here, but I would really be interested to know how many agents actually get that document signed or even actually talk about it. When I first started, that was just pounded into my head in real estate school because I actually went <coughs> to physical class, not online. And I remember driving around in my car with a folder and I had like a hundred of these printed out. Like I was going to go and meet a hundred buyers the first day I was in real estate. Cause I was so <laughs> scared that I wasn't going to be able to present this document to them. Right. And it was a process and it's still a process for me. And there's no difference now is to have that hard conversation. And I remember being like, nobody's going to sign this. They just met me. All that document was, was an explanation of agency. And the more that I did it and the more I got used to it and the more confident I got, the easier it was. And to be honest, I actually gained a lot of buyer's trust because I'd start hearing people say, I've talked to 15 agents and no one has shown me this. And I was the first person to show them that, right? And it kind of elevated me from a standard of professionalism. And I believe this is the same thing. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, this is a document that we need to discuss. And it talks about my value and what I'm going to do for you. And this is our agreed upon, our agreed upon fee. And so having that conversation, it's going to feel weird in the beginning, but it's going to become our new normal. And it is all about the process. And any agents that aren't doing that are working outside the law. And, and so if you had that conversation with your buyer and say, wouldn't that raise a concern for you if they're, you know, working outside the law like that, right? Yeah, it makes you, it makes them realize, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm actually sitting in front of the first person that is actually doing the job legally the way they're supposed to be doing the job. Does anybody else have anything? I know um, we've got a graphic I'm going to throw in that is from the, um, the YouTube link, but it's about what can you do today? Like working with sellers, if you are sitting in front of sellers yeah. and go lay down. I don't want to lay down. I want to. <laughs> okay. So um, if, does anybody have any questions on this topic before we talk about that? Okay. Um, Anna, will you start talking? I'm going to drop this graphic and I can't multitask and I don't know how to do that. So you yeah. start. Yeah, absolutely. I'll start talking. Um, this has been one of the things that um, I think Leanna is on the call, one of my um, partners. And um, this was like, she sent me a message. She's like, okay, but like, what do I do today? And like, it was a voice text and I didn't respond because I was like, I don't really know what you need to do today. Um, because it was it was Monday and I'm still processing. Um, and so that's one thing that Alice and I were, you know, really like digging in on. I was like, what are the small shifts that we can start making today? Um, Alice and I can put this up on you. Do you want me to screen share or just leave it? Can everybody see it? Well, you're the tech girl in this relationship. So I I'm love just going to put it up. I just feel like it's helpful to just have it on the screen. Everybody can see just that hopefully and not my entire desktop, which is super messy. Yeah, we got you. So again, guys, this is in the YouTube link that I posted, but this is a, what can you do today? And Anna and I really want to formulate and start talking about um, pieces of, of graphic that we can start taking with us to our buyer and seller consultations. Um, and it talks about like, what can you do today when you're working with sellers? And, you know, I had a listing appointment yesterday. And the first thing they said was, let's get the elephant out of the room. And I said, great, let's do it. Like, let's, let's talk about it. And so, um, you know, if you're talking about your listing presentation and you're explaining to sellers, like, let's just get through the hard conversation and say, like, how does compensation work currently? And what does compensation look like moving forward? Um, that to me, it's like Brett said, this is kind of the same conversation. We, we want to compensate buyer's agents because I need to explain their value to you. I need to talk to you about the stats of, you know, you can pull stats of how many actual dual agency um, contracts have happened in your market. Um, and then you can say like, this is the value of a buyer's agent, you know, over 75% of our, of our properties have been, um, have been co-broked. Right. And we needed the buyer side to, to bring, um, to bring the buyer to us. And then many of our MLSs are reporting that 50% or more of the sales have concessions. And so we start talking about um, the commissions as concessions, right? That's a big difference here is it's a buyer concession because we as buyer's agents are going into employment and agency agreements um, because the buyers are paying our commission. That's, I think, the big misconception here um, is that the seller isn't paying the commission. They're paying a buyer concession and how that concession is used is a pre-negotiated um, payment and commission between the buyer's agent and the buyer. 
And then talking about who our buyer is, uh, Tina talked about this in the mastermind that she did that some markets might not be as affected by this because some people can bridge these gaps and they can pay the commission differences. But what if you're working with that FHA buy buyer or that BA buyer? Somebody in the chat box talked about how do we verify that our buyer can pay us? So I think that's a good open conversation. Does anybody kind of want to talk about that? Like, how do we know if that buyer can actually pay us? No, scary conversation. <laughs> hey, I'll pipe in. I would sorry. say whenever we, I'm sorry, I was a little no. delayed. I would say, wouldn't that be a part of, um, you know, proof of funds or um, so, some of that conversation of a proof of funds? I mean, of course, if they're pre-approved for FHA or, or VA, they, they may have little money, but you can have that conversation kind of like you would when you're screening them for, you know, do you have a pre-approval? Are you buying with cash? Well, how much cash do you have? That kind of thing. Yeah. So it's part of the buyer consultation. And I, I'd right. like to pose the question, are you unwilling to represent that buyer if that buyer is unable to pay you and you are unable to negotiate a commission on your behalf? Yeah. Joy, Joy, did you have something to, to say? I'm sorry. No, you're fine. It's not Joy. It's Stephanie. Sorry. Oh, sorry. oh hey, I'm sorry. Just, it is me. I'm on her laptop because oh. I'm streaming my laptop on the big one. So, um, okay. no, I was like, so you guys know my, well, some of you know my market. Like I'm working with those first time VA home buyers and I'm working with these people that I work hard to make sure that they don't come out of pocket any money at closing. I'm negotiating closing costs for them, all of the things. So that's a genuine fear that I have. Um, you know, you said, what happens? Are you not going to represent them if you can't get paid? Yeah, I'm the type of agent that I am because they need me. And that's just who I am as a person. I'm not going to let them go unrepresented because maybe the people that they refer me to are going to be the ones that can pay me. Right. So um, I just a great mind. Yeah, I just worry about that, though, is getting to the table, even with some people, maybe not even just first-time homebuyers, just anybody. They, they'll they sign a document. They're going to pay you. You get to closing. What are you going to do? It's not like the, the sale is contingent on you having those funds at closing. So you're still going to close on your house. You're still going to close on your loan. You're just not going to pay me. What do I do? I take you to small claims court to, like, get my money? No, I you know think, what I mean? I think the mindset, I think the mindset here has to be having very, very good buyer consultations ahead of time, understanding what your value proposition is. And then here's the difference. It's the agents that have the ability to negotiate on their buyer's behalf and their own behalf. You, you have the ability to negotiate. It's just like, I think Brett was the one talking about with for sale by owners or for instance, if, if you have investors, we do have investors at a high level and we go and find off market properties. And a lot of those sellers do not want to pay you. And so we talk to our investor and we say, Hey, I found you a house. This is the house you're looking for, but the seller's unwilling to pay me. Are you willing to bridge that gap? Are you willing to pay this commission? All the shift is, is that we have to negotiate for our, for our commissions. Now that is the big shift. And, and frankly, I feel like if you're a strong agent, you have the ability and I think that communication and collaboration with other agents is going to be key. It's about being able to pick up the phone and say, what, what is the concession on this? What is the buyer concession offered? And, and being able to negotiate on your own behalf. I don't know if, if, if that resonates or if you agree with that, but I think that's the big key here is being able to have hard conversations. And that's where community um, within the realtors um, world is going to make a big difference. And so, I just want to point out, I just see a couple comments, like, you know, uh, Dixon mentioned, like, you're like, is your broker going to approve Stephanie of like you not charging a buyer and, and providing to, that representation? Uh, Allison VA buyers, right? Um, I think we have to remember, like this ruling came out on Friday and there's some organizations from the top down that are going to have to make some adjustments. Brett, you just mentioned it with the VA, like we're not, we haven't seen the reactions from other stakeholders in the marketplace that are probably going to have to shift as a result of this. So I think it is from a buyer perspective, I think it can be a little hard. Like, I think we're asking questions when we haven't given some organizations the opportunity to make some shifts. Um, I, I fully expect that like every brokerage is going to have a game plan for what happens when that buyer gets to the table and they can't pay you there. Like that is something that's not been an issue. So there's not been a, a fail safe for that. 
But I, I feel confident, especially where I am, that that is going to be something that's tackled and we're going to have a plan going forward. So I think it's really tough to to get all of the kinks worked out on this right now when you still have like really big organizations that are going to have to make procedural shifts based on what's going on. So I think that's, I think, I think it's important to talk about, yeah, VA buyers are not allowed to pay commission on purchases, Liz. I, like that's a hundred percent a problem. I, I fully expect that we're going to have to see a shift away from that. There's going to have to be something that comes. And that's, that's the reason I think that we've got this time. So um, I think getting into the weeds on some of those like minute moments are probably um, a miss for right now. And it's really more just like overall, what, what do we need to, to be looking at and, and what, what conversations do you need to be having with leadership, with organizations, with lenders right now to get all the facts so that you can start building um, a plan and influence? I mean, one of our big things on our team is being an agent leader, like ca call your leadership of your brokerage and say, hey, what like, what are you thinking? What's going on here? Talk to your local you know, broker in charge and say, hey, what do you all see coming down the pipeline on this? Get involved now um, so that these conversations are open. Because yeah, there's gonna be a lot of shifts that are still to come that we don't know what what's going to happen and how we're going to shake out on those. Allison, let me ask you, is your, are, when you go into listings, is your presentation, oh, sorry, um, is your presentation still going to be, hey, Mr. Buyer, my R fee is 5%. Are you still going to offer, I guess, ask the seller, like, this is, these are the reasons why we should offer compensation to the broker or Anna. Like, I feel like that's still, it doesn't, Correct me if I'm wrong. It doesn't say that the seller cannot offer compensation. It says it cannot be marketed in MLS. So Correct. I think, Correct. you know, if again, we... I don't. Go ahead. I don't want. I don't want to make legal statements, right? I yeah. we we started this with that we are not the gurus here. I have watched yeah. some YouTube videos, and I am not by any means the the bee's knees. But um, I as a as an agent, um, I find a high value, and I find um, I find a lot of value in buyers and agents um, as the listing agent. I am not the person that says I, I want to do both sides. I've I've worked through this domino effect in many many scenarios in my head for people that say, well, I'm going to just be a listing agent. I'm going to be the listing agent. Well, I want you to think about what that looks like. So if you're the listing agent and your messaging to, to your seller is that, well, you don't have to offer compensation to the buyer. I want you to, to realistically think about, you know, eight years ago when I got into real estate, it used to take 12 to 16 months sometimes to sell a house. I used to want to be the third listing agent on a property because that's how long houses took to sell. And a lot of agents have forgot about what that looks like because houses are selling so quickly. About my, um... So I was holding, you know, 36 listings at one point and I want... I want you to realistically think about what it looks like if you're not compensating buyer's agents. So now these buyer's agents get the call. They want to go show the house, ALM, appointment, location, motivation, set that appointment, get in the house. But the buyer won't sign that document, right? Because the, and the agent doesn't want to show it because they're not being compensated. I call Tim. I say, hey, Tim, what's the co-broke? Tim says zero. Well, I'm not getting in my car and showing this because this buyer won't sign a document saying that they'll pay me. So now all of a sudden the market starts to soften and days on market go up and I'm a listing agent holding 36 listings. I can't show 36 listings a day. If you realistically think about what this looks like and how this affects you as a listing agent, and if your whole goal is to be a listing heavy agent, because gosh, the market's shifting and those buyer's agents, they're, they're screwed. They're SOL, right? Think about what that does to your business. You have to be so confident in the value of a buyer's agent that we articulate this to our sellers. And this is where we hold the key to what this looks like. So the answer is yes. I sat in a listing appointment yesterday and I talked about the elephant in the room. I talked about how valuable buyer's agents are. And they looked at me and they said, so you're telling me you don't have a buyer for this house. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, if I did have a buyer for this house, I would expect to be compensated for it. Hey, Allison, I, I learned something um, a couple weeks ago, which was really surprising to me that in South Carolina, um, we learned this from Darcy, that, at, you know, there's always been the conversation about, okay, well, if, if you're not showing houses that have a lower co-broke or no co-broke, that's unethical, right? However, it is completely legal to establish that upfront with your buyer that if you are, if you come across homes that are less than this fee or offering no fee, 
that you have every right to not show it to them. And as long as that buyer agrees to that up front, that is completely ethical and legal. And so I think if if you have that conversation as well, like, you know, number one, are you willing to compensate me if there's a shortfall? And the answer is no. Okay, so then number two is obviously, you know, we've got to get paid for our services and our time. So given that circumstance, you know, it seems likely to me that we're not going to be looking at properties that are off, that are not offering a co-broke or are less than what we've agreed upon. That's a, it's a good point. And that's also why I think that the state of South Carolina, when they change these agency documents, it's important that we're using them correctly, right? Because right now, the way that they are, I, I would bet that a lot of them have zero. They still have 0% in the agency document because agents are saying, I work for you for free. You aren't, you don't have to pay me. But what that's saying is that that now obligates me to show them all of the houses, right? Because I've I've pre-negotiated a commission with that buyer ahead of time. And so again, I don't know what North Carolina looks like, but with South Carolina, our agency documents are already updated and they are already in place for us to, to negotiate ahead of time with our with our buyers on what that agreement looks like. Anna said, Tim, your calmness and confidence is is what we aspire to adapt. I can't be that calm. It doesn't matter what the topic is. <laughs> There's no calmness. There's it's just no funny. It's, here. it's just funny. See, I mean, but that's the thing, right? Like that's that's the beauty of our industry. It's like you can do it so many different ways. Um, but you know, both both of you like have a different energy, but it's just funny to to hear them next to each other. Allison and I should go on listing appointments together. I should, because you're someone's for everyone, you know? <laughs> we would give each other whiplash, you know? They they go from zero to 60 so quick, Allison you know? and I could never go on an appointment together. They would be like, These <laughs> women need to leave my house. <laughs> <laughs> what about those listing agents not experienced enough um, or even allowed to do dual agency? The buyer is really flying blind. They won't be getting paid yeah. That's a good point, Jennifer. That's kind of what I was kind of touching on is that in the in these listing appointments where the seller says they're not offering co-broke and they say that like I want you to represent the buyer for free, right? Or I want you to not get paid to represent the buyer. I think that's going to come down to your brokerage uh, rules as well. And again, I don't I don't know what everyone's brokerage is going to roll out or what they're going to allow, but there's a lot of brokerages that say you you can't do that. You can't represent the buyer for 0%. Um, and that buyer's not being represented. And maybe that's where transactional brokerage comes in. I know in, in South Carolina, I think, I mean, in uh, Florida, that's a thing. So I, again, I don't want to get into the weeds on the law of what's going to actually happen, but I think that that does start to cause issues. Um, and then what stops listing agents from compensating via referral? Again, I, I think that you have to have these conversations with the seller and, and listing agents bringing value to the conversation that we've always compensated buyers agents and and this is why and it's always been negotiable it's just the conversation to have and i think it really lies in what messaging we're giving to our sellers and why um compensation and concessions should be offered um i think that we control that narrative as we go into these listing appointments and we start talking about about these concerns Does anybody have anything else? We typically, um, you know, we want to hear from you guys and we're, Anna and I, like we talked about, there is a link, Anna's going to drop it again. Um, and we're going to do a, another kind of mastermind and hopefully have some, some content and buyer and seller guides that we can share with everyone. Brett, you got your hand raised. I mean, I'm just speaking out loud. Obviously this is just something that's going through my head, but you talk about um, you know, sitting down with buyers and determining if they can even afford your services if the seller doesn't pay it. I mean, it opens up the question of like flip it, right? If you're sitting down with a seller and they can't afford your services, if a buyer's agent can't pay you, right? Like, are you going to choose to do work for free on the listing side? Like, I think, I don't know, I guess that's where my mind goes of like you and like where law changes are going to take place, right? If something doesn't happen and it's legal to do so, are you going to work for a buyer that you know can't afford you if a seller doesn't offer that compensation, right? Like, does that make sense? Am I just 
No, ab- absolutely. It it does make sense because, you know, if if that is what happens and that's the trend, because trends will come and go, right? And there's going to be lead and lag effects of this. Um, and if all of a sudden we all say, well, we, we've just all been so used to the seller paying me and the seller won't pay me, or like you just talked about, we've all been so used to this market being so robust that the seller can pay us. There's so many mar- there's so much margin left on, you know, meat on the bone, right? There was a time when sellers were having to come to the table with money because they they were underwater on their property. And we're in this robust market where sellers have so much meat on the bone that they're getting checks for 100, 200, sometimes $500,000. So what happens in the scenario when the market shifts to a point where neither can pay, that buyers are underwater and they can't get what they need for their house and they can't you know pay their mortgages off and seller are buy, uh, I reversed it, but sellers can't pay. They don't have the, the meat on the bone from the transaction and then the buyer can't pay you. So what happens to the real estate industry at that point? There there are a lot more questions than answers. And I mean, we don't want a doomsday prep by any means, but Brett, that's where you have to just know your value and you have to decide what you're willing to work for. Because it really, in the end, it is a negotiation between you and your buyer. That is the first step. What are you willing to work for that buyer for? I think at the end of the day, we go to the most negative situations, right? Because we have to prepare for the most negative situations. But I honestly think overall, it's going to be super positive and we won't run into too many situations. I mean, other than the things that obviously need to change like VA, but I think that's where everybody's mind immediately goes is like, what if this person has no money? But what if they do? And what if a majority of your buyers really can? Because I feel like depending on the market you're in, especially the triangle, it's it's wealthy people. I mean, even the ones that can't afford as much, they find value in representation. I just feel like people find the money. If they find value in you, they will find the money. And beyond that, you just have to know your value for somebody who doesn't necessarily have it to go to the seller and say, look, like they need a home to live in. And it's my duty to try to find that. Can we work together? So I guess all of that to say, I think we go negative, but I think it'll be great. Well, and one of the things is like Tina mentioned, the buyers were always paying the commissions. They're just wrapped into the price. Because if you think of that house being 360,000, the seller pre-negotiated 6%, the buyer's willing to pay 360. So essentially if they're paying for that, they're already paying the commission. So, you know, I know that I was thinking about that too, about the seller concessions. Like what if the house is 300, the commission's nine grand. Now you're at 309 with 9,000 in concessions. Are we going to be inflating the prices a bit? And then how are appraisers going to work through that? So I think there's just a lot of things, but in the end, the buyers were always paying the commission because they were paying that price of the house and it was included in it. It's just going to now going to show different and we're going to have to find a new way around it. Yeah, I, I used that tidbit yesterday with someone. They were like, they're, you, I watched their brain blow up. I was like, well, the buyers were paying, <laughs> buyers were paying the commission anyways. But um, one of my big things too is like, I feel like sometimes we make long-term decisions on short-term discomforts and nothing makes me crazier than that. Um, so I think, you know, overall, it's like we have to be able to pivot and adapt and change. And this is kind of like, uh, Dixon, you've been adding some things in the comments, like, I just think as a whole, like we can't make long-term decisions on short-term discomforts. Like we can't completely change games because one little thing, and I would challenge all of you, if you're kind of struggling with the mindset shift here, um, The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek is one of my favorite books. Um, It's been a game changer over the last year for me because the the concept of the infinite game, and now I'm going 30,000 feet up in the air again, and I'm sorry, but is that you know, we, we have a game of business, but the rules are always changing. We just saw that happen on Friday. The the players are always shifting in and out the, the end goal, the way that we score points, everything is constantly evolving in business. And, and the purpose of the infinite game is just to keep playing. So um, I'll kind of leave it with this. I think my big challenge for everyone on the call is um, just make that mindset shift to realize like, Yes, the rules just completely changed on how we do X, Y, and Z. But the the point of business is to keep playing um, and and do not make long-term changes in your life over a short-term discomfort um, because most of the time that's just a shift that's causing a level up. Um, so I, I just think that it's really, really important. Mindset's going to be super important right now. And so my challenge to you is also just like make sure around people that are 
that are uplifting, that are challenging you to do the best thing that you can. Um, it, it's going to be a tough time, I think, to be in negative rooms. So find positive spaces um, and know that like the opportunity for your business to grow, I think, is boundless right now. And I, I this morning was super encouraging to me. Thank you, Tim, Brett, Ashley, everyone that contributed, everyone in the chat. Like it was just great to know that we got lots of smart brains that are are willing to pour into one another. Um, and I think that's what being you know an entrepreneur is all about is the the rooms that you're in with the people that you're sharing your ideas with. Any parting thoughts from any wise people on the call before we tell you to go out there and crush your day? Ashley, any last burning questions? No burning questions. Trust me, I am really, as Tina was talking in our team meeting yesterday, she's staring right at me. I'm like, stop it. Because, you know, I'm just, the wheels are turning, but we'll get through it. I, I think like exactly what you said. I love how you said, don't make long-term decisions on the short-term, you know, thing that comes up. Like that's something that I do. People go down the rabbit hole. It's like, take it day by day. It's not happening right this second. You got to internalize it. Think about it a little bit, figure out there's no better group to be in to give you strategies on how to move forward with this. Like Anna and Allison are two of the smartest people I've ever met. And of course, Tina, who I work for, but if you follow their lead and you listen to these conversations and look at the material and the content they're putting out, you will thrive in this market. You will actually have more opportunity than anyone else in this market that is running the other way. So I think being on these calls, collaborating with people and really networking with agents in the market when these offers do come in and there is struggles, when they know you and you can benefit from networking, that is going to be a thing that is going to pull us through this market, I think. I agree. I just dropped that link one more time. Go ahead and um, feel free to subscribe. We'll send out an email over the weekend to let you know when we're going to get that schedule. But again, just a strategy session to literally sit down, pull out our buyer, our buyer books, our listing presentations and say, where are the holes? Where are the gaps? How can we improve these? Um, and, and where do we know that we need to continue to fine tune? Because obviously what's been working as far as these compensation conversations for the last couple of years are not going to work um, going forward. So um, feel free to, to log in and um, give us your information and we'll send you an email out and let you know who all is coming to attend that um, kind of strategy session. So thanks everyone. Uh, this recording will be up. So if you feel like you want to share it, um, it'll be on YouTube end of day. So um, Agents Empowered, our YouTube channel has every recording from Wednesday. Next week we have Miranda coming on to talk about PC or sorry next week we have Eli Harris doing short-term rentals and um, we have Miranda coming on the week after to talk about um, TC work and and what that looks like and then I'm really excited um, one of uh, Ashley's team members is coming on the week after to talk about um, buyer consults I just noticed on Facebook or Instagram he was constantly in buyer consults at the office and I was like how are you getting these people to your office teach me your ways um, so Corey's going to come on and talk about that and then we just booked Brett Davis for 417 to talk about that menu of services and her listing presentation. So we've got a whole April jam packed full of great topics. Um, if there's anything that you need help with in your business, or you have a superpower you want to share, always let us know because we love collaboration. Have a great Wednesday, everyone.